They are the ongoing scourge of wars all over the world. Landmines from Iraq to Egypt, Ukraine to Afghanistan. They continue to kill long after the fighting has ended. But how big is the challenge of clearing them? And are these explosive remnants treated with the same seriousness as in an act of conflict? This is Inside Story. Hello everyone, I'm Kamal Santa Maria. They are the dormant legacy of war until, of course, they are triggered. Landmines continue to affect the lives of so many people after conflicts end, even decades later, as is with the leftovers from the Iran-Iraq war, for example, in the 1980s. In fact, Iraq is one of the world's most affected countries, with thousands of landmines planted close to the Iran-Iraq border. And around this time of year, they're even more of a problem. The rainy season means earth gets washed away. It can reveal new mines or it can even relocate ones which were already identified. Activists are now calling on people to stay away from 60 specific locations in the area of the Khanakin district in Iraq's east. Landmines kill thousands of people Every year, the latest figures from the international campaign to ban landmines found almost 7,000 people were killed or injured in 2018. That is a rate, incredibly, 20 people a day. But in 2013, that figure was half that. So what has happened in the past five years to make things so much worse? Well, quite simply, more conflicts. We're talking about Afghanistan, Mali, Myanmar, Nigeria, Syria, Ukraine. But interestingly... Egypt and Iran are actually the two countries with the most landmines, 23 million uh, in Egypt and 16 million in Iran. So we've got three experts to talk through this issue today, starting in Baghdad with Jonathan Guthrie, uh, program manager for Iraq at the Norwegian People's Aid, working on demining uh, in Iraq. In Brussels, we have Alma Taslijan Al Osta, who is the advocacy manager for disarmament and protection of civilians at the aid organization Humanity and Inclusion. Finally, in Kabul, Victoria Fontana, professor of peace studies at the American University of Afghanistan. Thank you to all of you for joining us today. The type of topic which, well, we could talk about at any particular time, but Jonathan, I will start with you, seeing as we want to just zero in on Iraq initially. What fascinates me is that this particular district, close to the Iran border. So we are talking up to 40 years ago these mines might have been planted there, definitely at least 30. Uh, and they still have such a huge effect, such a, 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 an extraordinary number of them there. That's correct, yes. It's, uh, there's, it's, Iraq is one of the most contaminated countries in the world and, and, uh, and unfortunately it's, a, it's the Iran-Iraq border that has most of the uh, traditional type of landmines that most of the world would know about. Um, it, it still remains. So what does your group do, Norwegian People's Aid? Are you out there f in the field physically doing it? Yes, we are. We're, um, Norwegian People's Aid has been, has been working in Iraq and supporting the Iraqi people now for 25 years. Uh, initially working uh, along the Iran-Iraq border within the Kurdish region um, until approximately 2008, at which time we refocused our efforts towards the south. Uh, which was in Basra, um, where we're still operational today, and uh, conducting clearances both on, on minefields along the Iranian border, but also some of the air-delivered weapons resulting from the 1991 and 2003 conflicts. Um, and then, of course, more recently, with um, you know, the, the, the conflict with Daesh and the liberation of Daesh has left huge amounts of, of contaminated land and buildings and infrastructure with improvised explosive devices and improvised landmines. And, uh, and much of our efforts is, is, uh, is being used to, to clear those areas, mm. mostly in Ambar district and, and in around Mosul city. Just before I bring in uh, our other two guests, I just want to quickly get a, a feeling from you whether you actually feel like you are ever getting on top of this. Because as I pointed out, this goes back to the 1980s. And then as you've pointed out, it's just been added to over the years, the two Gulf Wars, uh, Daesh or ISIL as well. Do you, does it feel like a losing battle sometimes? 
it, it does feel like a bit of a losing battle sometimes, but um, I mean, we're, there, there is uh, quite a lot of donor support and, and then there is a lot of support from, from a number of countries around the world. Um, it is probably one of the largest programs in the world to date. Um, but it also has one of the largest, um, you know, contaminations and one of the largest problems in the world. Uh, the, the relatively, you know, accurate amount of support is 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 getting to the people on the ground. Mm. But when there's constantly, you know, every decade a, an, another conflict that's just adding to the contamination, it, it can feel like a bit of a losing battle at times. Okay, let's build on that now with uh, Alma Loster joining us from uh, Brussels. I guess uh, to continue from what Jonathan was saying there. In any conflict or any area where landmines are a problem, you never quite know the true extent, do you? For example, in Iraq right now, as I said, the rainy season means it's actually, you know, it'll wash away the earth and suddenly there could be you know, double the amount in the same place. Exactly, yes. This is um, unfortunate with the fact that we, we don't know what is the extent of the contamination in the whole world. For example, we know that there are 59 states that are contaminated with uh, landmines and other explosive remnants of war in the world. And we know that some of these states have a contamination which is more than 100 square kilometers uh, which is quite an extent for for population that has been waiting for years for these landmines to be cleared. Um, what you have mentioned that happens in Iraq uh, right now, we have known that it happened uh, before in other countries that are uh, affected that were affected by the conflict. For example, in um, I would say in Bosnia and Herzegovina, a few years ago there was an extensive um, and massive problem with uh, floods. Their uh, landmines came out of the ground and were relocated from the river banks and ended up in rivers. And we know how then this contamination gets from one area to another. Mm. So um, it is not a new problem for us. Uh, it is something that we are massively working on and working hard on this, on resolving this issue. And we have seen such a massive progress as well. Mm. So um, it is, uh, as as my previous speaker said, it's something. It, it feels that we have been doing this for a long time, but we are determined to continue working on this uh, for the following, let's say, five years until mm. we have a deadline. And I know you grew up in uh, uh, Bosnia as well, and you've probably got some personal stories you can tell us. I'll come back to that a little bit later on when I sort of get into the idea of, of, of growing up and, and, and living in these areas. In the meantime, I'll bring in Victoria Fontan in uh, Kabul. Nice to see you again, Victoria. As far as cleaning up goes, and again, I might use the Iraq example, um, I mean, where does it sit in the end? Local government, as it happens, this particular area in Iraq is, is disputed, um, uh, ownership, if you like. Is the responsibility with government to do this or, or does it just get left to the NGOs and, and the charity groups uh, like Jonathan's group, which, which go in there and, and do this, this very difficult work? Well, the responsibility should be with local governments, but the extent um, of the humanitarian situation very often makes it very difficult for local governments to actually uh, dedicate uh, funds to these uh, to these particular initiatives. There are populations that need to be fed, that need that, that need to be relocated, and that makes it very difficult. Also, it's important to understand that the clearance of a landmine can cost between three hundred and a thousand dollars, and so my colleagues would be uh, much more able to to this discuss that. But so that makes it again very difficult for local authorities to um, uh, to handle. I would say that uh, in the case of Afghanistan, uh, the uh, clearance operations are very much uh, left to uh, the NGO world and to the United Nations. And um, again, due to the humanitarian situation, uh, that is to be expected, unfortunately. You know, seeing as you've mentioned the, the, the cost, I might go back to Jonathan briefly, just seeing as this is the, the job you're doing, Jonathan, and actually maybe explain to me and explain to our viewers um, in the simplest possible terms, how do you demine an area? Um, Victoria has pointed out uh, that it is costly. Um, I'm just really trying to get my head around how it's done and, and sort of the level of painstaking work that's involved. Yeah, it, it is costly. It's um, and, and it's manpower intensive normally in, in the general context. Um, and, and that's why it is it, it is quite costly. Um, we have approximately 350 staff throughout the country and 75% and of our funding goes on on salaries of staff. And mm. um, the, the process is, is basically we're mapping or gridding off an area and then using a, a metal detector primarily in, in manual clearance teams and using a metal detector to try to pick up the metal signature of the landmine or the, the item of ordinance that you're looking for. And then, um, you know, and then and by hand excavating that, that item 
to confirm that it is actually a landmine. And then depending on the types of items that we, we have, we either neutralise them and remove them for, for safe disposal somewhere else. Um, or if it's, a, if it's an unsafe to move type item, then it gets dis destroyed in, in situ with explosives. Um, there are other tools uh, available and, and we're using them in Iraq also. Um, so we, we rely heavily on machines. Um, there is purpose-made demining machines, which will have a, a series of chains that, that may flail the land in front of you or disrupt the land in front of, in front of the machine and, and actually detonate the, the landmine. Um, uh, there's, also, uh, there's also other things that have what, what's called a tiller bucket, which will sift or, uh, or, or rotate the soil and expose the landmines. Um, and we use machines quite a bit here in Iraq, but we, we use normally an off-the-shelf um, plant equipment. We, we have them armoured up to international specifications, and then we've designed our own tools to help us uh, gain access to the landmines um, and, and also uh, help us to neutralise and disrupt the, mm. the landmines. So we rely quite heavily on machines and, and they tend to be a, a bit more cost efficient. And then MPA um, as an organisation, we, we, we're probably one of the largest users of mine detection dogs around the world. Mm. Um, so, so we utilise animal detection systems quite a bit uh, in many of the countries that we work in. Here in Iraq, we have not been using them up to date, but we're actually starting a program this year and, and introducing uh, dogs to, to assist in the clearance of, of buildings and improvised landmines throughout the, the north and the, the western parts of the country. But it, it's a painstakingly slow process. Um, in, in, the, in the improvised explosive device area, we are moving much quicker than in the more traditional mine clearance areas. Mm -hmm. um, there's areas on the Iran-Iraq border that have minimum metal um, within the, the landmine itself, which makes it extremely difficult to, mm -hmm. to be able to identify and, and makes the process much, much, much slower. Um, also in vegetated areas, having to remove the vegetation takes, takes even more time. So it, it is costly, uh, it is time consuming, and, um, and, and unfortunately this, this will take a, a very, very long time to clear. That's fascinating. Jonathan, thank you for that, because as I say, I really wanted to, to try and get an understanding of, of how it's done. Alma, perhaps you can give us a different perspective. I mean, Jonathan's just explained, he talked about, you know, gridding off an, uh, an, an area and working through that area. Now, you grew up, as I understand, in, in Bosnia and had to deal with the knowledge that these were there as you grew up. What is it like actually growing up in that sort of environment? <laughs> Well, that, that's a very difficult question to come around in, in, uh, in a short answer. I could talk about uh, that for hours. Mm. Basically, um, I first encountered the presence of landmines when I returned to Bosnia um, after being a refugee. And I remember that schools had massive efforts to tell us what exactly was the problem and how to deal with the contamination problem and how to deal with the science and uh, what to do and what not to do. So if you ask me how I felt at that moment, it, it felt that the war was continuing and it didn't stop at that very moment, mm. as we were told and we uh, we felt like uh, at one stage. But I think that the most work was done through schools and I think mm. this is something very important that should be continued. Uh, risk education is something that humanity and inclusion does in uh, all the countries where we are operating right now. And um, we believe that providing uh, education to kids especially is very important to, uh, for not just for their safety at that moment, but it's just the way of playing in the future and how they're going to transmit this information to their uh, peers and mm. how they are going to make sure that everybody around them is safe. So okay. um, living in a in affected country is not easy. And I remember the first time when I uh, when I traveled uh, outside uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina and when I stepped on the green grass oh. that I never had this fear um, as I had before, and it just faded away. So uh, it's it's a big relief, and I can imagine that um, in the following period we are going to do a lot of work to make sure that kids feel the same, yeah. and, and adults, not only kids, and it's, it's very important. That's extraordinary. OK, so what we've spoken about up until this point is all reactionary, isn't it? It's about trying to clean up a mess from all these conflicts. Ideally, we need to be in a position where they're not being used in the first place. So, Victoria, let's come to you to start this part of the discussion. Uh, as far as prevention goes, are inroads being made worldwide 
to actually stop landmines being used in conflict. Because as we saw in those numbers I said at the start of the show, you know, the, the, the numbers only increased in just the last five years. Of course, uh, there is a treaty, the Ottawa Treaty of uh, 1999, uh, which actually bans the use of landmine and that makes it a violation of international law uh, to be used. However, uh, 33 countries still haven't signed uh, that treaty. And that treaty prevents the use of landmines, but not the manufacturing of landmines. And so many um, uh, countries from Europe, uh, from uh, uh, North America, and of course Asian countries still manufacture and sell those landmines. So in effect, the treaty uh, has been very criticized quite um, relentlessly because of that fact that it actually prevents the use, but not necessarily the, uh, the manufacturing. Why? This is more of a maybe a psychological question, actually, Victoria, but why would 33 countries not want to sign up to this sort of thing? I look at the list uh, of this uh, Ottawa Treaty mm -hmm. and, you know, among those 33 countries, you know, major UN players, United States, China, Russia, they don't, they're, they're not part of it. Exactly. So one of the uh, top five, I would say that, well, for the United States, uh, they argue that they actually uh, want to use it in relation to the North-South Korea um, uh, conflict. So every country has a good reason uh, to use and to also manufacture landmines. And um, I guess that it is really because of real politics more than anything else. It's good to sign a treaty. It's good to negotiate a treaty. But at the end of the day, when one of the high contracting parties' interests are at stake, they just don't want to budge. And they uh, either sign and not ratify or they just don't sign or choose an a la carte version of the treaty. Hmm. Yeah, it sounds a bit like the Paris Climate Agreement, actually. Um, can I come back to you, Alma, for your <laughs> thoughts on that? And, and, I mean, is there pressure going on countries to sign up properly? I know the United I, States I hasn't signed, but I did notice in 2014 they said, we'll abide by it in theory, but except for, as Victoria pointed out, the North-South Korea border. Yes, I just to come back on what Victoria was saying about the Ottawa Treaty, uh, we know that it has been questioned a lot about uh, its uh, functionality, let's say, on the field today. But um, I would just like to say that uh, 164 countries have signed on to the treaty, so they have banned complete use, stockpiles, uh, production, uh, transfers. And what is most important, all these states that are parts of par state parties to the Mine Ban Treaty are... Uh, right now implementing this treaty by clearing the landmines, assisting hundreds of thousands of victims, providing risk education, uh, destroying stockpiles, and making sure that communities are safe. So I would be quite sad if some of the um, uh, of our society thinks that uh, Ottawa Treaty is not really successful. I think it's making a major progress. And if we look only to the to the results of 2018, there is only one state, non-state armed group that used um, uh, landmines. Um, it was, I, I believe, in Myanmar, according to the landmine monitor. Mm. And this um, uh, country is not state party to the mine ban treaty. So I would say that landmines are less and less being used today. There is, there are few challenges that we are facing today, of course. Uh, but I, I would. I would advocate still that Mine Ban Treaty, uh, the Ottawa Treaty, as, as it's also called, is one of the most successful humanitarian uh, and disarmament treaties that we see right now. Jonathan, do you want to add something to that? I saw you nodding earlier. Yeah, I mean, I, I would just like to agree with what our, our colleagues have said. Um, I, I think that, you know, that the Ottawa Treaty has been extremely uh, successful and, and having 164 states sign up to it, yes, there are other states and major players that have not signed up to it, but it, it has been quite successful um, and, and it's been probably the, the most successful uh, uh, arms, arms treaty to, to date. Um, what I can say, and I think this is probably leading on to the next question, is mm. you know, this, is not present, this is not preventing the use uh, from, from non-state actors using landmines. What we've seen from Iraq, the conflict in Syria, and also seeing it in Yemen, um, is that non-state actors now cannot actually get their hands on landmines because less countries are producing them. And, and that's a fact. So what are they re reverting to? They're reverting to actually producing their own landmines. So what we're finding is a, you know, a, a, a massive use of improvised landmines and improvised explosive devices mm -hmm. on a scale that's never been seen before because they're manufacturing their own. Um, and, and this is something that the, the treaty 
does not and, and probably cannot address. But so is this what you saw, is this what you saw with ISIL in Iraq then? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it was these these things have been mass produced in factories um, created by 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 ISIL and uh, and just mass produced in the the hundreds of thousands and and spread across northeast Syria and, and Iraq. Mm. Victoria, is there any way to counter that? It almost feels a bit like the, um, pardon my phrasing here, the suicide bomber argument, the fact that if someone wants to blow themselves up, they will, and it's very, very difficult to stop that. Similarly, if someone or some group wants to build improvised landmines because they can't get them from elsewhere, then they'll find a way, won't they? They will, uh, and um, and I have to say that, you know, agree with my colleagues earlier, maybe I was a little negative on the uh, Ottawa Treaty, <laughs> Um, I guess that what's really important to remember is that political solutions are um, the only way to resolve conflict. And so, of course, anybody can use uh, or can manufacture uh, uh, improvised minds. But at the end of the day, those treaties and uh, that awareness has to be coupled with political solutions to conflict uh, and, and also, um, and also a prevention. But in relation to ensuring that those are not going to be used, it's really about uh, stopping that conflict from a different uh, perspective and, and at a different level. And uh, shall I say that there's a report that just came out on the Afghan conflict uh, a week ago from the Institute for War and Peace Studies in Afghanistan. And it says that 80 percent of Afghans now realize that there is no military solution to the conflict and that the solution has to be engineered politically. And I would say in relation to landmines and improvised mines, it is exactly the same, um, the, the same answer today. Alma, um, Victoria brought up a, an important word there, awareness. I mean, we're having a, a half-hour discussion here on an international news channel. It's great. Hopefully lots of people will watch it and learn about it. But I feel that landmines uh, perhaps don't get the, uh, the, the, the publicity. It's, it's sort of an ongoing problem which maybe isn't seen as an acute problem, whereas, as we've all discussed today, actually, it's everywhere and it's a major hazard for a lot of people. Yeah, exactly. Um, humanity and inclusion has been doing so much work to raise <clears throat> uh, pardon, um, awareness about landmines uh, presence and what do they do. Uh, and we have to break the stigma that landmines only kill. It's, it's not really true. It is the biggest problem, of course, but having a landmine in your neighborhood doesn't really affect only your life. It affects how you're going to use that land, how you're going to transfer through it how your uh, your animals are going to uh, uh, move around your uh, your home so it, it has really a socioeconomic impact that cannot really go away just by ignoring the problem in a way it will stay unless all these landmines are taken out and um, uh, it will stay there until uh, the international community is really determined to fix this problem mm. together with the governments that are affected. We were talking um, previously about the uh, about the role of, of governments. There nothing can be done unless the government is on board. So all the strategies, all the plans have to come from their side. Clear visions on how they want to deal with this problem and how do they want to fix uh, the contamination problem and, and how do they want to assist the population that is living in affected areas. So it's a multi-stakeholder approach. Uh, money is not the only issue. The governments that have to sh step up and show the, the, the ownership, let's say, of this problem and the idea and the plan how to solve it is the best way how to, let's say, move uh, forward and, and deal with this problem of, of landmine contamination. Alma, thank you for that. And also, Jonathan and Victoria, thank you so much. A really interesting uh, discussion, and you each brought uh, your expertise to it. So thank you so much. Thank you for watching as well. If you head to the show section at aljazeera.com, you can see this episode or indeed any of our uh, other ones again at your leisure. You can also hit us up on facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story for more discussion on Twitter. We are at AJ Inside Story. I'm at Kamal AJE if you want to get in touch with me directly. In the meantime, from the whole team, thanks for joining us and we'll see you again soon.